There we go. Um, so today we have um, Suzanne um, Dang um, coming on and sharing her story story with us. And I'd like to um, allow her to introduce herself today and I will be sharing um, her PowerPoint. Thank Hi, you. First, uh, first, I would like to acknowledge and pay my respect to the elders past and present to those who have passed before us and to the members of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community who are also attending the here today. <clears throat> so who am I? My name is Suzanne and I'm also known as Susie. I am an artist. I have been doing art since I was 14. I'm 31 years old now. And I mainly like to paint during using acrylics. I have showcased my artwork in about four exhibitions in Brisbane. I work full time in mental health as a peer support worker, and I mainly teach art to adults with severe and complex mental health issues. And at work, I'm in a prog program called LEAP, Live Experience Activities Program. And I also run other groups such as Mindfulness, Make It At Home, which is basically an online group. And I teach the clients how to make herb damper, origami, soy wax candles, and much more, all over Zoom online. I also do another group called Peer Chicken and Coffee Chat, which is basically a group where there's no structure and we all check in with each other about our mental health over Zoom and overall is a very chill group. I have been working as a peer support worker for almost two years now. It takes me 40 minutes to drive each way, but I love my job so much I don't mind. I drive about 70 kilometers each day because, but because the job is so rewarding and gives me meaning to my life, I don't mind at all. In fact, I love driving too. I am also a model. I have been modeling since 2013 quite actively. I do runways, swimwear, photographic and beauty. I love modeling because it makes me feel more confident in myself. I am a national finalist for a beauty pageant called Miss Royalty International and I'll be competing in Melbourne this year in September. I am a blogger. I blog about fashion and fashion events. I have attended fashion events in Sydney, Melbourne, Cairns and Canberra. I love traveling to fashion events, dressing up and networking with other people. Meeting new people in fashion is great. When I meet someone new, I have an elevator pitch. I say, hi, I'm Suzanne. And I have shared my, I'm Suzanne and I'm a mental health and fashion blogger. I share my story and recovery journey about how I overcome bipolar and what I do to overcome it. I'm a speaker and I have shared my story of overcoming bipolar on stage at events, for example, Carers Queensland Mental Health Expo, Gold Coast and Brisbane Disability Expo, as well as Care Expo in 2021. I love the idea of public speaking. It scares the crap out of me, but the feeling afterwards is so amazing. I feel accomplished and getting feedback from the audience makes me really happy. I have also done some podcasts too and done several interviews with SBS Vietnamese and talk mainly about how there's still a lot of stigma in the Vietnamese community around mental illnesses. Another creative outlet I do is photography. I love doing events photography. Um, I love meeting lots of people and seeing them enjoy their events and getting their photos taken makes me happy. Although I used to be a wedding photographer, I found this area of photography didn't suit me. I found it really stressful and so I moved on from it. Most importantly, I am also a fur mum to a beautiful cat named Riley. As you can see in the PowerPoint slide, he's a domestic short care and a rescue cat. I've had him for a bit over two years now. Yeah, next, please. I was born and raised in Brisbane. My grandparents took care of me after my parents divorced when I was four years old. My grandparents are the pillars of my life and I'm very close to them and love them very much. My grandpa is 91 years old and grandma is in her early 80s. I also have three younger half-siblings 
and I also love them very much. My older and biological sister lives in Denmark. I'm glad to say I'm quite close to all of them too. Next, thank you. What happens when I'm, I'm unwell? I hear voices. The voices can be inside or outside my head, can be a female or male voice, or even a child's voice. They sometimes tell me I'm not worthy, that I'm not enough. The voices are always negative, and sometimes they tell me to hurt myself and do something bad. But I challenge these voices. When they tell me I'm not worthy, I challenge them with, I am worthy. When they say I am not enough, I tell them I am enough. Spending lots of money is also a sign I'm not well. Spending lots of money on material things such as clothes and booking flights to different places without making an informed decision and out of the blue was something I struggled and faced with. I used to be really hypersexual. I got myself into very dangerous situations. I got involved in unsafe sex years ago and the other guy who would do stuffing, meaning he pulled out the condom halfway through without my consent. A particular guy gave me SDI and thank God it was chlamydia and not AIDS or HIV or something. Just a tablet was needed to cure this SDI I had at the time. I have also been raped in the past by two guys I was in relationship with. I didn't consent to the sex and found myself in a very vulnerable situation. And I feel part of my hypersexuality was part of my mania. The last time I was suicidal was last year. I had a big disagreement and conflict with some people and it triggered my anxiety, my bipolar in a negative way. I attempted to overdose on my medications and had to call an ambulance afterwards. Next, thank you. What are my warning signs? The feelings of hopelessness, wordlessness and helplessness would overcome me. I would have trouble sleeping, have conflict with others, have changes in my mood, as well as struggling to keep up with my usual work routine, such as managing a full-time job committing to exercise four times a week and incorporating self-care and self-love every night. Next, thank you. What can I do to help myself? I believe exercise is very beneficial for my mental health and I exercise four times a week with a personal trainer. Painting in acrylics I find is also very relaxing and distracts me from my negative thoughts and emotions. I feel lost in the painting once I start. I listen to music every day, in the car, in the shower, and whenever I have the chance to. I listen to all sorts of music, such as Indian, Korean, Japanese, Spanish, and Vietnamese. I have two best friends who understand me and I can rely on them when I'm in a bad situation and need help. One of my bestie I have been friends with for over 18 years. We met in high school. She's an amazing person and knows how to take care of me, especially when I'm in a crisis. For example, she was there when I overdosed and knew exactly what to do and called an ambulance and be able to stay calm and collected during that difficult time for me. There was another time I was having suicidal thoughts and didn't act on it. She would take away my medications and hid the medications because I have a pattern of wanting to overdose when I'm unwell. Hid the medications in her place so she, I couldn't find it. I really value this friendship. I also love eating out, especially during these stations. I am a foodie and so on some days it's bad. Treating myself to a nice meal lifts my mood. Next, please. Sometimes all I need is to surround myself with people. Taking myself to a busy cafe, inviting a friend over for dinner or simply go to the library to study. Next, please. I remember so many years ago, I had half a glass of rosé wine at a Christmas party and I went straight to hospital for suicidal thoughts. There I learned not to mix my medications with alcohol. I guess I learned that the hard way. 
Like I mentioned before, giving a medication and getting it locked hidden up somewhere is important to make my environment safe. Next, please. I have so many reasons to live, not just for family, but be able to share my story of hope and survival to others and strangers, whether that's online or face-to-face. -face. One big reason is the work I do in mental health as a peaceful worker. For example, I had a client who was feeling suicidal on the way to the art group I facilitated. And halfway through this art session, she no longer felt suicidal. Another good news story is a client of mine who really wanted to see his baby son, but his ex-wife didn't allow him to see the baby son. But after a few art sessions, the client did with me and showed his ex-wife the paintings he did in the program. She was so surprised and felt happy that he's doing something good with his life. She allowed him to see the baby son now. These are just two of many good news stories I would like to share. The work I'm doing is impactful and powerful. It's not just a job to me, it's a passion and be able to work in mental health and make a difference to adults' lives with severe and complex mental health issues. I really love the idea of helping others and helping clients reach their goals in the LEAP program I'm doing in my work. Another big reason to live is for my cat, Riley. He is a therapy animal to me and I love him so much like he's my own baby. On those days I feel depressed or contemplating suicide, I try to picture and imagine him without me. Who would feed him? Who would take care of him if I died? I know pets are a big responsibility, but it's so worth it. I tell myself I need to continue living to help him be a healthy cat and relies on me so greatly. Next, please. What did eight years of modeling taught me about life? One, it's not about the free photos. Sure, I have done a lot of TFP time for print over the years. I used to love getting free photos on photo shoots, but I learned that it has taken me some time to think, you think, rethink why I'm in, in the modeling industry. I go back to my why, why I'm in this industry. Is it just for free photos? If so, I won't last in the industry, I tell myself. Because when the going gets tough, the only reason that I'm in the industry for free photos is just not good enough. Two, it's about the people. One thing I love is getting people and creators together to make a story and make photographic artwork. It's not about whether I get paid or not. It's not about if I'm more confident than other female models. It's not about whether I get more modeling gigs than others. It's about meeting with like-minded individuals and creating something beautiful together. Art, beautiful art. Three, success is not, by measured, is not measured by how many likes I get on my modeling photos. I used to think my worth as a model was based on how many likes I got on my photo and Instagram and Facebook. I sought validation from getting likes, but no, I have moved past that now. I'm a unique and beautiful human being with my four flaws and everything. My worth is measured by what I tell myself, not based on how many likes there are. Next, please. What 2021 taught me one, my story of surviving bipolar is actually really powerful. I did more than three public speakings last year and some of these gigs were paid. At the beginning of the year, it was one of my goals to get paid for public speaking. And wow, I actually ticked that off my list. My story is every so powerful. And for one particular gig, I shared my story of hope and overcoming bipolar to almost an audience of about 100 people. My story is, in, is impactful in a positive way and I share it authentically and vulnerably. Two, I can maintain a full-time job. I got employed in my dream job of mine in June in 2020 or so. At the end of this year, I have worked, at the end of last year, I mean, 
I have worked in mental health, mainly teaching art to adults with severe and complex mental health issues for almost two years. I love my job. It, although it takes me 40 minutes or so to get each way to get to work, I don't mind. I don't care about the long travels. I love my job so much that I don't mind at all of the travels. Work hasn't always been easy. I was a victim of being bullied earlier this year, too, actually last year. But I managed to work it all out with a great team and high management at work. I am always learning new things and where I work, learning and understanding my clients get better each day. I learn to have work-life play balance. The importance of self-care and self-love is crucial too. Three, true love didn't happen this year, but that's okay. I really embrace being single this year and enjoying and finding out what I like, love by myself and in other men. I deeply explore my asexuality and what I want from a romantic relationship. Part of this is learning to say no when I especially don't want to think from a guy. I feel empowered, powerful and strong for standing up for myself and what is right. For example, I went on a date the other time and the guy asked me if he could kiss me. Normally I would say yes, but I was strong for saying no, because deep down I don't want a sexual relationship. I told myself no sex before marriage and because I am asexual. Next slide, please. I remember my very first public speaking gig. It was back in 2017. I was invited to be a panel guest speaker for a Bristol City Council event. Public speaking, as I said before, scares the crap out of me, but the feeling of accomplishment after doing it is so amazing. So what do I love about public speaking? One, I get to share my story of hope and help others. As someone who's very open about bipolar disorder type one, a lot of people can relate to my story. They find it relatable. And I feel so amazing when people come up to me after speaking gig and give me positive feedback about my talk. They sometimes tell me how good I was and how it helped them. Two, I love sharing my story and there's no right or wrong. I used to think my story wasn't good enough. I wasn't worthy enough. To share, to share my story because it's not as good as other people's stories. I will compare my life to others, but that's not true. My story of hope and overcoming by a follower is unique and beautiful. There is no right or wrong way of sharing my story. I own the story. It's mine and no one can share a story as the way I do. Three, the adrenaline rush. The feelings of nervousness, as I kind of touched base on before, I get so nervous before each speech, but I go back to my why. I want to share my story of hope to help others, to empower others. The adrenaline rush doesn't last long when I'm sharing my story halfway. I feel more at ease and tell myself that my story is an interesting story and I can help others. Next slide, please. When I was younger and still at times at this old age, I was really hard on myself. I would compare my teeth, my body, my grades to other people. I felt that my self-worth is based on how many followers and likes I had off from people. Little did I know that I would no longer be attracted to these exterior things. My self-worth has nothing to do about my followers and how many likes I get for my posts. It's about giving myself self-love and self-care every day. To not please others. To not always say yes to everything but I used to be that girl who couldn't say no. I would be raped in relationships because I didn't know how to say no to the other person. But it's not my fault that I was raped. But one thing I do believe, I'm a good person and a good person can also make bad choices. I have made bad choices in men and I acknowledge and accept that. I learned from these experiences and as I reflect on it, it has shaped and given me more resilience than before. Some of you might heard from this from me before. I add grit into my life. I am who I am. I am someone with real lived experiences and I want to create an image role model for younger girls that through difficult times, 
and experience it. I want to create an image role for young girls that through difficult times and trauma, one can add grit and build resilience through the negative experiences. I love doing self-care and self-love. For example, finding joy in making a cup of tea, listening to calm music, long hot showers, or even using art as therapy. For me, as an artist, I use art to release my creativity and everything. My art speaks to me and also to other people. So self-love begins with you. That begins when you know your goals, you know your worth, you know you're capable. No one else can do you better than you. Sometimes it takes stepping out of your comfort zone and doing something new. Take up a new hobby. Do something that challenges you in your day job. You are who you tell yourself. If you tell yourself that you're ugly, you start to believe that you're ugly. If you tell yourself that you're capable, you are capable. If you tell yourself that you're enough, then you're enough. Self-love is not external, but internal. Take care of yourself by starting a mantra to start each day. Tell yourself, I am capable. I am worthy. I am enough. I promise it will get easier each, each day. When I found out I got bipolar as my diagnosis, I froze. I didn't know what to do, what to say to myself. My journey is definitely had good days and bad days but it's the bad days that help shape who you become. Next, please. I feel my experience experiencing romantic love has been hit and miss. After my first boyfriend broke up with me, I wanted him back, but he didn't want me anymore. He also said he was planning to propose to me. Thinking back and reflecting on it, I'm not sure if I wanted to trust his words about the proposal. We were together for over two years, we try to live together, we spend a lot of time together. And when I reflect back, I feel I have been raped in this relationship too. He didn't and couldn't take no as an answer. Some days we could do it five times a day. So how does this experience shape me and what I find is true love? True love is not just all about sex. True love to me is giving yourself to the other person, serving one another, being able to communicate assertively, making sacrifices and more. My experiences of being abused are still very clear to me. So clear. I want to give myself all the self-love I need before committing to a new relationship. It's not easy to do this, but I'm enjoying my single life as much as I can. What are my tips for those who are bipolar who want to find love? Firstly, invest in time in yourself, into your well-being. Love your starts with yourself first. You need to build a foundation of loving yourself, accepting yourself for who you are. You are unique and everyone with a mental illness has a different set of values and qualities, just like how there's no two DNA the same. Accepting yourself for who you are is the first step to finding love. When the right person comes, they will continue to build that foundation that you have made for yourself. Don't find love so you can feel complete in yourself especially having bipolar. I believe someone is there and comes at the right timing in my life when I have built that foundation in myself. I want to be self-aware as much as possible, be able to know my signs and symptoms when I get unwell, when I hear voices and have anxiety attacks. Then when the right person comes, I can educate them on how to look after me, teach and educate them what my signs and symptoms. Life is better with two people but there must be understanding and mutual respect. Communication is important too. So this brings me to the next part. Can people with bipolar live fulfilling lives? Yes, of course they can. We are all human beings with unique qualities as I mentioned earlier. Loving someone with bipolar is just the same as loving someone with that. We are all human. Sometimes I wonder if my bipolar gets in the way of me finding true love. But I tell myself, I am someone unique, beautiful, and worthy of love. Next, please. For me, looking back into my past, I wish I didn't go through some things. For example, I wish I knew how hard it was going to love someone else before getting into a relationship. Sometimes I'm manic. 
Sometimes I'm depressed. I found that having bipolar makes me a bit harder to date, but it doesn't mean I can't be loved and feel loved. I found having bipolar makes me harder to date. Definitely, hypersexuality wasn't present in my life for quite some time. I found it extremely difficult to control myself from going to clubs and being vulnerable, be taken advantage of, being used, being abused. I am also a DV survivor. I have met one of my ex at the club, which isn't the best place, but I still gave him a chance. And it turned out to be one of the worst friendships I've ever been in. I even tried to put a DV order against him for rape, but apparently I didn't have enough evidence. And so my case wasn't successful on my, on my end. Well, I'm proud to say that I'm a DV survivor because there are so many women out there who can relate to me and my unique experience. Loving with bipolar is hard. It's hard work, like any relationship. But I learned love in different and hard ways. My family really never approved the guys I meet, to be honest. They said I have a good taste in men, <clears throat> meaning that I can't even find true love because I always pick the wrong type of guys. They are protective of me, especially my grandparents. They always told me not to date men because I'm in clubs, but I didn't listen to them and learn love the hard way. I had to get an SDI to learn such a powerful lesson in my life. I even allowed my grandparents to match make me with a guy in Vietnam. They looked at his horoscopes and they say both of us aligned well. This relationship lasted long distance for only three months, 13 months only. I never kissed him. We did long distance and it was really hard. I never even hugged him. Well, at least I gave the relationship a go. I learned that I can be in a relationship without being able to do the physical and sexual side of things. I believe every relationship I've had, whether it's short term or long term, there's a lesson to learn from it. It's not easy to get in a relationship with full confidence. Learning to make it work with the other person is hard already it is. I try to not doubt my capabilities. I'm a unique human with qualities that are attractive. Next, please. It can be very distressing for someone who's hearing voices. Here are my tips. Number one, ask the person what would help. Suggest so perhaps listening to a nice song, a cup of tea, or go for a walk to distract from the voices. If the voices tell, tell them to hurt themselves like overdosing and medications, or and, and get something to hurt themselves, help the person remove the medications and knives. Two, don't make judgments. The more you judge, the less you understand. Don't think people who hear voices are crazy. They are also human beings too, who has very real and unique experiences. Three, let them know that they are not alone. When I hear voices, I feel very lonely in my voices and thoughts. I want someone to reassure me that I'm not alone on this journey, that they are with me through the thick and thin. Four, if it gets too much, call triple zero. People who hear voices need emergency help too, especially when it's getting too much, especially if the voices tell them to end their life and have a plan in place. The person's safety is most important. Five, don't forget about your own mental health too. Supporting someone who hears voices can take a toll on your mental health too. Don't neglect your health and remember you are important in this journey too to support someone else. Next slide, please. To the doctor who implied I was lazy and just sitting on a pension. You won't believe how far I've come. A long, long way, I tell you that. It was your comment that gave me drive to get off the pension. And not to just prove you wrong, but prove to myself that I can be of someone useful in the community. Be someone who had purpose. Be someone who would inspire. Be someone who would show that hard work can come with someone like me who is disabled for life. I want to thank you for making me angry. Your judgmental comment changed my life. 
partly if it weren't for you, I wouldn't be where I am now. I am no longer on the pension. I'm working full time and work hard for the money I earn. Too bad I won't be seeing you again, doctor. You won't believe in what a person I have become. Next slide, please. I'm not gonna lie, when I applied for the mental health job, I had no qualifications whatsoever laying to it. I was still studying and was only a quarter way into my mental health course in subject four. I still haven't finished the course I started. I'm still studying self-paced and online while working full-time. I am naturally a very friendly person too. I am a people person. I care a lot about other people, sometimes more than myself. I'm usually the life of the party. And yes, I remember names better than faces. I proved to myself that one can get a job without qualification. I am working full-time in mental health as a mental health peace book worker. And I get to be creative in my own job. I get to teach art to adults. I have a good range of skills that can be used to be successful in this mental health job. My friendliness, my creativity, my positive attitude, and my passion to help others. This job also allowed me to express my creativity even more. Before coming to this job, I naturally had have a positive outlook on life too. No matter how many times I've fallen down, I still look for the positive in life. I am very lucky and blessed to get this wonderful job where I can give back to the community as well. Next, please. Many years ago, I got excluded from nursing in my early 20s for continuous academic failures. I thought I was the biggest failure in my life. Well, back then in the world. I thought once I failed, I would fail even more things. Little did I know that this failure in life would teach me many things in life. I learned that when life gets tough, you have to hold on to hope, in which I didn't at the time. I went down in an emotional spiral and things just got worse and worse. If I remember right, shortly after, shortly after my exclusion, I was admitted down into the mental health ward for three months. There I tried many types of medications. My journey recovery with mental health issues would begin there. If I didn't fail nursing, I wouldn't be here. Tell my story of hope and recovery. My story is a testimony of God's grace upon my life too. I pray that I will continue to learn about life and what works and what doesn't work for me. Next slide, please. I remember in 2007, I was a very insecure girl, not confident and always had issues with my own body. I compared my own image to other girls. I believe and told myself I had the worst body in high school. No matter how much I would eat, my body seemed to never gain weight. Fast forward a few years, I had my first episode of depression and started on antidepressants. My body's metabolism started to slow down and I joyfully watched as my body weight increased. As I became more sedated and the doses of treatment for my mental illnesses increased, my appetite increased. But deep down, I was hurting and angry and asked God, why did he put me in this position? I was angry at God, so I left my church for a while. I found myself to be in a more emotional turmoil and having watched myself be admitted in this child hospital several times already. As I gained more weight, I found I wanted to be battle with the modeling industry I was then in and help reshape the appropriate body image of models in the industry and try to be a role model for young girls and people who were interested in modeling. I helped be a role model and hopefully inspired those who wanted to try modeling. I found myself starting to have medication withdrawals. Withdrawals so bad that I couldn't eat, see all my friends for two months and crying almost every night. And in turn, I lost seven kilos naturally, but I ended up in hospital for almost as a week. I ended up in hospital for a month. I want to reach out to especially young people, whether you're on antidepressants, pharmaceutical drugs or not, there will always be a silver lining. Bodies will always change physically. It's just inevitable. 
My journey has been a roller coaster of a ride for sure. And although my memory is somewhat fragmented, I feel at times due to side effects of medications, at least I have a story to tell. I tell, try to tell myself these days that there's no such definition as a perfect body. I pray to God that I will always remember these words and ask God for his spiritual covering and protection as the body will grow or and shrink later on and that I don't have to be on this medication for the rest of my life so I can live a natural life. Next slide, please. I clearly remember my very first psychiatric hospital admission. I was put on ITO, involuntary treatment order, at the Prince of Alexandria Hospital in Brisbane. I was bizarre, I was suicidal, and spent at least a day and more and more in the emergency mental health ward. My belongings were locked away. I didn't have much of me at all. I was allowed to use the phone. Well, I wasn't allowed to use the phone, not even pen and paper to write something on, as I was on suicidal watch. My first mission was around three months in the mental health unit. Because I was on ITO, I had to comply with all the medications they prescribed me. I was 19 years old, I'm 31 now, and this was my very first experience dealing with mental health issues. I was put on, I was also put on constants close to everywhere I went, it's meaning that the, to the toilet, sleeping in my room, everywhere I went, I was followed and watched by a mental health nurse. This lasted for two months. I was really unwell, I couldn't eat, I thought the food was poisoned and couldn't shower myself and sometimes had accidents in my pants. After three months, a few days or so after my discharge, I was required to go to the mental health tri tribunal. If I remember right, this particular meeting was to see whether I should be still placed on the order or not. Luckily, the ITO label was taken off me. But I also remember the staff saying, it's also really easy to be put back on ITO if something happens. There have been times I would be, have been voluntary as a patient. I would call the ambulance when I was suicidal. And I remember telling the paramedics, please put in your notes that I am voluntary. As I didn't like being on ITO, I feel I have no control over medication, mental health. Although I have been in and out of hospitals 10 times, hospital system 10 times or so, I think I lost count now, as I've been in and out a lot of times. But for to say the least, I have been back to the hospital for all over two years now. Next slide, please. There will be people, three things I wish I knew about love. One, there will be people who will want to take advantage of you. Not just taking advantage of me sexually and mentally, but emotionally as well. Be careful of who you meet. Be mindful of the possible red flags. You want someone who you can trust and grow with and be a better person as the day goes by. There are many men who want to take advantage of you and you will learn from the negative and bad experiences with that. Be careful guys who shower you expensive gifts. They have ulterior motives if they do that. Number two, love will hurt as time goes by. Yes, the beginning of the relationship seems like rainbow and butterflies, but as you get to know each other better, there will be fights and flaws that you have to pick up with the other person. Will you compromise to make the relationship work? How much are you ready to compromise? The more you know the person, the more things you realize you don't like about the other person. Do you know what you want from the other person in the relationship? You wish there was an easy answer to everything, but there isn't. Three, be ready to be challenged emotionally and mentally. As you know the other person more, they will challenge you emotionally and mentally. They may be jealous of you having guy friends and don't want you to have any. They may comment on how you dress and how you present yourself through fashion. They may comment on how you would use your money and time. Be careful of being at risk of being in domestic violent relationship. And domestic violent relationship doesn't mean just being hurt physically and sexually. It could be mean the other person controls how you spend your money and how you use your time. Next slide, please. A letter to my 14-year-old self. Dear 14-year-old Suzanne, you got used to putting on a fake smile even though you were hiding inside. 
You told people you were okay and strong, even though you weren't coping. You put on a strong and resilient mask on wherever you went. But in actual fact, you want someone to tell you that you matter. Someone who you can cry to and have a shoulder to lean on. The truth was, you had no idea what mental health was. The truth is, you would grow up to be a mental advocate and be the strength for those who are weak. You fight battles every day, but they help you become who you are in the future. You are inspiration for many. Your story will speak to many people. You will help more people than you think. So please don't be so high on yourself, the young Suzanne. From Suzanne. Next slide, please. How has it been changed my life? I have been on this powerful medication, if you remember right, almost over two years now. I have greatly benefited from this medication in combination with my Abilify monthly injection as well. The combination works well for me. So why? Number one, I sleep for at least 10 hours each night. This medication has a sedating effect after taking it. I literally have to be in bed an hour or so after taking clozapine and then become all drowsy. I have at least 10 hours of un uninterrupted sleep each night and every morning I feel energized to get out of bed after having sleep of at least 10 hours. As you may know, this is a lot of sleep. As you may know, the sleeping pattern for people with mental illnesses is really important. For some people, this is a lot of sleep. But for me to be in working order, I need this amount of sleep to function. Two, I properly carry out all my ADLs each day. I cook, I clean, I study and look for enjoyment in my employment each every day. Clozapine has had a big effect on my mental health in terms of dealing with my activities of daily living. I try balancing out my work-life balance. I have a reason to get out of bed every day and I feel motivated to reach my short-term and long-term goals in life. Three, I become more responsible in my mental health. As I mentioned earlier, I juggle with a lot of things in everyday life and I wouldn't be here without the help of this medication, which perfectly and chemically imbalance, balances me. I realize that my counseling appointments are just as important as my social life appointments and psychiatric appointments too. Next slide, please. How the NDIS changed my life, the National Disability Insurance Scheme. I am one of the lucky ones who have received a really good package out of the NDIS and I am plan managed and not NDIM managed. I have had immense empowerment or support throughout these two years of receiving the NDIS package. It has changed my life. And here I list why. One. They support me to drive again. This one was a very tricky one for me to overcome. Having had two car accidents in my lifetime, I was traumatized to not drive for about three or four years. The NDAS paid for all my driving lessons with the PA hospital so I can rebuild my confidence in driving alone again. The amount of support I received from this area in my life was great. I am confidently driving again and I'm so, so proud of this achievement. Number two, reinforce my love for art. The NDS funded for all my art workshops, classes with access to arts in the past. I was given opportunities that I did not know about, all, about at all. One opportunity was the chance to paint a real piano, paint a, on, a, on a real piano and have it displayed at the cancer ward at Princess Alexandra Hospital. I was very blessed to have to show also showcase my art at different art exhibitions and I'm so grateful for that. Number three, they support me in my health and fitness. I exercise four times a week and their NDIS pays for all my PT training sessions. Since starting exercise, I physically see improvement in my mental health. My training sessions usually start at 6 a.m. before work. I have been able to incorporate early PT training in my everyday life. Next slide, please. What were five important things I learned at rehab? At the mental health rehab I was at, was called CCU, Community Care Unit in Kupuru. Number one, medication management. 
I learned the importance of medications and I got educated by doctors and nurses on how to have them to have how to have them to help me. I feel I have tried every single antidepressant and antipsychotic so far, including Valium. If I want to have a medication withdrawal, this will be the best place to have it, I reckon. Because their support and doctors and nurses work really hard to be on the same page as me. Two, exercising. I know this is a cliche one, but I never have never exercised so much in my lifetime until since coming here to CCU in the past. I feel motivated and I've never found exercise one until I came here to the mental health rehab. I found it challenging too, in a good way. I never knew I enjoyed doing so much squats. Number three, reaching out to my support network. During the time there at rehab, I must remember this place is only temporary. I won't be staying there all my life and I need to reach out to the community ultimately for support. I have friends and family who can reach out for support, not just doctors and nurses. It's just important to connect to my friends and family and let them know how I'm going with everything. Four, Finding new coping, coping mechanisms. That includes doing diamond pipe painting, a new form of visual art that I discovered, and using my DBT skills for stressful and distressing, distressing situations, and also reaching out to my support network. Also importantly, building the trust between my support worker and myself is just as important as reaching out to friends. When I, got, when I get emotional and feeling distressed, the main person I contact are the nurses there. Five, my safety plan. I reach out and look at my safety plan to remind me during the stressful situations on what I should do and the step-to-step -step process I should take to minimize any self-harm and be welcome in contact if I was running in trouble. I learned to make a safety plan while being here there at the mental rehabilitation place. It's a valuable tool. Next slide, please. My confidence didn't happen overnight. As a teenager, I like any other, I was trying to find myself and got lost in the midst of it all. Of it, all. it didn't help that I was, good, I was good at masking my feelings and emotions. I never shared to people when I was feeling down and, I was, and when I was younger, I just thought it was a weakness. But no, it wasn't that I was weak, but instead I was strong for far too long. Looking back at the first episode of depression, I was ready to end my life, but something didn't seem right. I knew something from my gut feeling that I was doing the wrong thing. So I didn't complete the suicide when I was 14. Instead, I found hope and confidence in my recovery till now. And each day I hone those coping mechanisms, coping mechanisms I have made for myself. And of course, without the help of family, friends, and certain doctors and nurses, and other mental health professionals too, I won't be where I am today. I believe I am confident the way I am these days because of my triumphs and mistakes I made as a person. Without it, I wouldn't be able to discover myself like this to this very day. Next slide, please. Three positive things I learned from living with bipolar. There's a lot of stigma around mental illnesses. Although it's getting better, we still face these challenges. For example, with everyday conversation, how easy it is to say good to the typical question we see every, every day, mean someone new, how are you? When deep down in ourselves, we are not actually okay and actually need someone to listen to us, even from a stranger at times, because why not? How often do we find in this rush society, it is hard to meet a stranger who actually genuinely cares about you and your mental health? And what actually would happen if we answered, no, I am not okay? And the self stigma we may face that prevents us from continuing that conversation. Living with that bipolar disorder type one has many disadvantages. I am challenged every day with myself when to share to a stranger I meet on the street that have bipolar disorder or knows I am not okay days. I ask myself, am I putting myself up for trouble by sharing too much about myself? Why am I trying to connect with this person in this way? Because I do find I have a tendency to share more about myself than the average person not in an egotistical way, but more like my struggles in life and so on. But in the midst of all the disadvantages of oversharing to a stranger and perhaps the dangers in it, on the lighter side, I found five positive things I learned during, since being diagnosed with bipolar. 
One, the better people stay in your life. And the people who un don't understand you won't. I have lost a lot of friends in this fight with bipolar. But I have also found very, some very genuine and authentic friends as well. I'm lucky and blessed to be surrounded by positive people. Two, your creativity and heart art heightens. I have always had an appreciation for art, but it grew since being in and out of hotel ward almost eight times now, and I've learned to appreciate it even more. When I think about my art, I think about my photography, my painting, my mindfulness coloring in, it's all very therapeutic. And three, you have more in insight into yourself. I'm becoming more self-aware of my thoughts, feelings, and emotions. I act on them much sooner if I sense something, un something unhealthy is about to come my way. When I feel suicidal, I have self-coping mechanisms like praying, and if they're not working, I reach out for support, such as Lifeline 13 Learn 14, and talk it through with a counselor if they be. And last but not least, um, slide, please. Yeah, so thank you for everyone for um, tuning in and listening to my story. If you want to, if you have any questions you want to ask me right now, or if you felt ask me like through my website or through my email, I'll say hop on there. You're welcome to, and I guess I'll open the room up for questions if there's any questions too. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for sharing. Um, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to type.